Welcome back to Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, Frank. So tonight, I just want to share something with you um, of a personal nature more than anything else. Um, nothing too highly political or theological or, or anything like that. Just um, I've been having a hard time lately with some, uh, some ailments and um, struggling with my disability. For those of you who don't know, I suffer from muscular dystrophy and it's... Um, it's taken a toll out of me at this point in my life, and um, I won't I won't get into a long story, but it's uh, has me thinking about the future, the, my life, things like that, my family, things like that. And when I do that, I often reflect back, and I have to be thankful for the time I've been given this world by our Lord and the blessings that I've had. Sometimes, um, I think when we suffer, um, if we're not in the right state of mind, we tend to despair oftentimes. And I think I do that as well, just as much as anybody else. Um, you know, our faith teaches us that our sufferings are a gift from God. And, um, well, you know, it's, and in that sense, while I don't question the theology behind that and the reasoning behind that, um, it gets tough sometimes, you know. And so I, I reflect back and, you know, things in life that you wish you you could do or could have done and, and the things that affect me and how my mind works oftentimes. Um, uh, when you have a, a disability like mine, your mobility becomes very, very, very limited. And in that sense, you, well, it becomes difficult uh, to do a lot of the, the ordinary things that most people take for granted every day. And for my part, there's a lot of things I can't partake of in life anymore because I'm losing my ability to walk. I'll be in the chair soon. I'll be talking to the Muscular Dystrophy Association in October, and I'll most likely be making a transition to the chair. And uh, it's um, it's been a very somber experience, I guess you could say, and difficult um, psychologically, emotionally, just as much as anything else. Um, when when those basic abilities, when you lose those basic abilities to function in everyday life. Um, it wears on you in every way, let's put it that way, you know? And so where you lose your ability just to do your everyday chores around the house. So, um, but, you know, one of the things that I was kind of looking for tonight is I did some praying. Um, I love to sing the Ave Maria Lord's hymn. Um, it's one of my favorites. I did an act of contrition tonight. Got to get my butt to confession. And uh, and I respect doing some meditating on our faith, our Lord, uh, the Blessed Holy Trinity, Our Lady. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, but um, my family church out in Sicily uh, came up on my YouTube feed. I've been doing some research on it. I'm going to post some pictures here of it. Uh, this is from a little island called Favignana. It's off the coast of Sicily. So it's a smaller island off the coast of Sicily. It's part of the Agati Islands. It's where my family comes from. My father was from the main Sicilian island land in Marsala, Italy. My mother was from Favignana, which is a smaller island. And these are pictures here of the church in town. Um, and I find it special because I haven't been to Italy since 1986. And, um, you know, you know, in life, sometimes you kind of regret the opportunities you miss out on. And as um, my disability has progressed, I've lost my ability to do, again, the most basic, simple tasks. Traveling has become, in many ways, impossible for me. Um, and, you know, we'll see if I can get some kind of mobility equipment, then maybe there's a there's a, there's a, a chance that I go back one day, because it's a dream of mine to go back to Italy. It's been so long, too long. I speak uh, an old dialect, uh, an old Sicilian dialect is what I, I speak, and... Uh, but uh, when I went back in 86, I visited this church a few times because it's right in the center of town, right in the piazza, right? There's a couple of churches in, in, on, the, on the smaller island of Fabiana. And uh, this one here is the mother church in the main part of town in the big piazza, right in the center of it. It's like I said to you before, the beauty of Catholicism and the, and the beauty of Catholic culture is that the church is always at the center of life. It's the backdrop of the culture. It's the, it's, it, it's, there's a cultural reinforcement. 
of the faith and the social norms, the customs, the morality. And because in the old world, the church had a symbiotic relationship with governments, um, it always played a heavy role. And that's why the church was always in the center of the piazza in any Catholic nation. And again, it, it played, it had a conscience in that respect. Um, and it's why those societies, at least from a moral perspective, function much better, much stronger, and uh, why the family was intact. Uh, for the most part, the culture was rich, vibrant, um, very, uh, you know, outgoing about the faith and how people celebrated it. Um, and, and the culture itself was predominantly Catholic. The Protestant Reformation never really made inroads in Italy, especially down south. <laughs> but I remember visiting this church back in 86. I was about 14, going on 15. Uh, it's a summer I'll never remember. Maybe um, the most special summer I ever had in my life. Um, and, uh, I remember visiting, and it's special because it's the church of my family, um, especially on my mother's side. This is the church where everybody was baptized, uh, first communion, confirmation. And, um, and, you know, those are three special sacraments that are special to us as Catholics when we're very young. Um, I received my sacraments out in, uh, in LA, a church called Mary Star of the Sea, where I got my Again, my baptism, my first communion, my confirmation. But this was the church of my my mother. This was the church of my aunts and my uncles. Um, and this was the church that, again, uh, my grandparents adhered to the faith to and brought their family to, to teach them the faith and how to celebrate the faith and honor the Lord. And it's a beautiful church. And it's just sat right and kind of in the back of the piazza there in the backdrop. And, you know, you have all the little stores all around it and the little the bars, the coffee shops, uh, things of that nature, the, the restaurants. Uh, of course, um, being a, uh, um, a fishing town that Favignano was, or a fishing island fish was, uh, of course, the, a central, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, it's what people ate. It was, a, it was one of the grand gourmets. Tuna was one of them because of the old ancient tuna runs that, that used to be made off that island. They had a, a special tactics on how to, um, they knew the the routes of the tuna. I'm talking about the big two, three, four, five hundred pound uh, tunas here from the Mediterranean here, and how they would kind of lure them into the chambers and, and things of that nature and catch the tuna. My grandfather did that when he lived that. He was part of that. And I think there's some ancient old videos from like the 40s or 50s that where we might have have noticed him. Um, you know, you could you could see it right on YouTube. The the, the Favignano tuna run, it's something interesting to watch and beautiful. And um, so, but anyways, this was the church everybody attended and the beauty of it. Um, I did find a little basis um, description on it here. Um, see if I can pull it up real quick here. Maybe I lost it here, but um, I believe it's called the Madrice, right? Uh, the, the, it's the Mother Church of Favignana and is dedicated to the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady. As you can see there, there is a, uh, a big statue in the middle of the church right on top of the, the beautiful door entryway there of the Immaculate Conception. I found a site here. I don't know what this site is here. Uh, enjoy Sicilia. Enjoy Sicilia dot it. And this is how it describes it. The Mother Church of Favignana, dedicated to the Mecca Conception, dominates the town main square. It was built in 1759 at the behest of Don Giovanni Luca Marquis of Palavicino and Lord of the Igari Islands, based on a project by the architect Don Luigi Gambina. The building is located the building is located in a decentralized position with respect to the center of square because of royal ordinance required to leave the space in front of the fort of San Giacomo free in order not to hinder the defense functions. The facade has an almost Baroque wooden portal and a architraved, excuse me, <laughs> a window enriched with a stained glass window depicting the same image of the Immaculate Conception present on the main altar. Crowning the facade is a bell gable with these with these three bells. The single nave interior features a Latin cross plan 
among the works kept inside the church, we mention a wooden crucifix from the Trapanese school dating back to the 18th century, a marble statue of the Immaculate Conception from the Spanish school, probably from the late 17th century. The documents found in the parish archive attest to the existence of an underground cemetery functionally until 1870, perhaps used as defense space during the wars, but definitely walled up during the Second World War. Okay. And see, that's what's interesting, because you can tell the church is pretty ancient, you know, by by sort of architectural standards, right? I mean, you're talking back to the 17th century sometime at the very least, maybe, you know, early 18th, right around there. So you're talking about multiple generations of a church where the faith was celebrated by its adherents. And again, because, you know, Catholicism has such deep roots, I think oftentimes in America we forget because we're a pluralistic nation and we have, again, the freedom and the liberty to kind of move and uh, any way we want and go anywhere we want to be anything we want. Oftentimes that plays out in religious life where, you know, religion in America through a concept of religious liberty becomes a democratic choice, right? And it's why I think in America value struggle and why social, cultural, and even more so family cohesion struggles in America. But imagine a church where everybody in, in town went to the same church one generation after another, you know, children, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, great, great grandparents, great, 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 great grandparents. It, it, it forms a, a cohesion and function in society to where everybody understands the common morals, the common values, and that cohesion is central because it starts really with faith. Um, you know, when, when one generation rebels or begins to splinter off and, and they adopt the alternative moralities of, of different churches and more Western liberal democracies, that's where the core essence of family begins to break down. When you have a situation where um, basic moral principles change um, based upon the notion of our fallen nature and our sort of, uh, our our, uh, how should I put this, our desire to seek sin out at times. And I think that's been the attraction of religious liberty is that we can make it up as we go. We, we're not held down by any type of tradition or authority in that sense to where in a situation on a small island in the Agati Islands out in Sicily, well, they didn't tinker with faith and morals. And with that came really strong cultural cohesion. Everybody understood the rules and you can respect every generation that ultimately you descended down from. Um, it's like I talked about so many times, this idea of rebellion against family, which is something strange to me, is something that was very, um, it just didn't happen in these old Catholic countries. I mean, don't get me wrong, you had your, your offshoot families. There was always sin. There was always a struggle. There was always um, a battle with the fallen nature of man. And, and, and oftentimes, even within these communities, people could lose the faith or just not attend or be you know, lukewarm in their faith, which presents problems, of course. Don't get me wrong. It's never perfect. But at the very least, there's a cultural understanding of what the faith is and what the mores and the morals of any given civilization are and that matters because that grounds us as a culture and uh, when people are ready to make that leap back into the faith they know what the rules of the game are they know where to come back to unlike oftentimes in western liberal republics where with the contradictions of all these different flavors of religions and christianity especially it's often a, a great challenge trying to figure out what ultimately truth is in these nations. And, and with all these contradictory points that we see, um, oftentimes it leads actually to a greater apostasy. Um, that's why the faith worked in the old world. People knew where the church was. It was handed down from one generation to the next. There was no rebellion against previous generations, not in a in a general sense, right? It might have happened again in the micro, but not in a general sense. Nobody was raised that way. So you're born, you attend the same church, you would have the same faith, the same sacraments, the same church teachings, right? This forms cohesion, and it attaches one generation to the next. 
It helps us honor previous generations, understanding the sacrifices, the blood, the blood, the sweat, the tears, but also it connects us to the to the previous generation. Where Western liberal republics that have the idea of religious liberty, we are detached from family. And so it's like I said so many times before, you know, in America, you could have parents that have, let's say, three children. The parents are, let's say, of an old uh, Presbyterian denomination. You can have one child go to a Baptist church, one child go to a Mormon church, one child go to a Calvinist church. And all of a sudden, they're still all good Protestants, even though they have all different standards, beliefs, and values that fundamentally break down. Sure, they may have the top 10 of Ten, top 10 points of the faith straighten out, and that's how they'll justify all these schisms and split. But as we've seen throughout history, in Protestant nations, the more you split, you divide, the more disunity you have at a, at a theological level, the more disunity you're going to have at a familial level, and eventually cultural, and eventually politics, right? That's why in, in, in at least Southern Italy, the talks of revolution were always kind of tamed down. It wasn't anything that we we struggled over for that, for really in that serious degree, like we've been raised in Western liberal republics. Don't get me wrong, there's always political strife. There's always things going on. We had Italian unification and all the nefarious things that were happening at that time, right? There's always political struggles. But, you know, the church in the middle of the piazza, that's what brings communities together. It what brings uh, it what brings family together, and really ultimately what forms the political discourse in society, and how it could bridge all these great divisions in in a particular culture like on an island like Favignano or any really territorial province throughout the world. And um, you know, if we worship as a family together, the more continuity we're going to have within that culture. It's like it's one of the things I struggle with American culture is that we're so divided because we all have these subjective moral values. And ultimately, because it starts with religious liberty, you get to use, you get to choose your values. I get to choose my values. But that eventually leads to complete breakdown of society or that culture or even that family for that matter. Right. Uh, so the church, the, the the dedicated to Immaculate Conception, has a special place in my heart because it's the church of my family. And it's why I understand the rules of the game. That's why the faith that I believe in, the same moral standards that I believe in, the same cultural values, the foods, the traditions, the songs, all of them, those, those are all handed down to me from my parents. They, they were handed down to them by my grandparents and every generation before that. So... It's just something special that I wanted to share with you. This is the church that really built the foundation of my family, at least on my mother's side. Maybe I'll talk about um, my dad's side, the Marsala, um, the city of Marsala in Sicily, where he was born and raised. My mom and dad did get married in Marsala. My mom did not get married in this church. Marsala is just about a 45-minute boat ride into the main part of the um, Sicilian island. And it's a beautiful town as well too. But just wanna share some photos, just some basic concepts and ideas. I haven't been to this church in, uh, since 86 and it will be a dream of mine to go back one day. I, I'll, I'll see what I can do in, in regards to mobility. But you know, the things we take for granted in life, I, I've learned that You know, I, I, I like to say I wish I could go back in time so I could do more of this stuff. Because oftentimes I think in this current culture, we get caught up in the money, the bills and how to generally survive. And you miss out on life. And next thing you know, or, you know, you wake up, you're 50 years old and you got a disability like mine and you just can't do the things you used to do. And the things that or, or at least that time where I could have gone back and, and, and cherished um this great, you know, this great thing of my familial line, the special place, church, time, space, things like that, it, it becomes much more difficult. And and throughout the course of time and space, as we become older, sicker, whatever you may have, you begin to realize how much time you truly wasted on the BS that life throws at you, especially in a lot of these um, secular cultures and now focus on just material ends right especially in this american culture that's all we do 
And oftentimes we're so caught up trying to make money or, or oftentimes just trying to pay the mortgage or whatever it is that we forget about the little things that matter, right? Culture, family, things like that. And, uh, you know, I like to say that I have regrets in life and, but I think we all do. Right. So this just popped up on my feed today. It's something I want to share with you all. Um, if you guys out there have a church, a, a special family church, I'd love to hear about it. But, you know, this here, uh, because it's such a small island off the coast of Sicily, I'm sure most of this audience has never heard of it before. I'm sure if I got family watching this, they'll understand me where this came from. And, and maybe they have more information than I do. Again, I haven't been there since 86. So all I really have is... Um, uh, a faint memory of the church. I remember being in there. I can see pictures of it online. I'm thankful for that. Um, but I sure, my, I would sure like to know more about my family church, this particular church here. Um, if anybody has any, any information that I'm missing. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, just a little personal story I wanted to share tonight. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me here on Frankly Speaking. All right. So this is Frank signing off. Good night, everybody.